Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to talk about this thing right here, which is the HP ProDesk 600 G4 Mini. Now, this unit actually has a Intel Core i5-8500T, which is a six core, six thread processor. We also have 16 gigs of memory, a 256 gig NVMe SSD with the ability to expand to more storage. We have 802.11ac wireless. And this all comes in a package that's about one liter. Now, if you're new to this series, at STH, we've been running Project Tiny Mini Micro now for a couple months. And in this series, we're taking about a weekly look at a new Tiny Mini Micro or Lenovo HP and Dell about one liter node. These nodes are really popular because they get sold to corporations and big enterprises where they're sold by the thousand. And as a result, there's a very healthy market for these, both in the primary market where you're going and purchasing new, but also in the second secondary market after they come off of lease or say a business goes bankrupt or whatever it is. And these systems come available on the secondary market and they're very inexpensive. They're also low power and they're very compact. So if you're in a apartment in a city or something like that, where you don't have a lot of room, these things are absolutely awesome. As part of Project Tiny Mini Micro, Nick already has a guide in terms of how to turn one of these into a PF Sense appliance. So if you want a firewall, you can turn one of these into a firewall. He also has a guide in terms of turning these into a Plex server where you can use the iGPU offload capabilities to accelerate your Plex media encoding and streaming. You can check those out on the STH main site. Now, depending on when this gets published, it may be just after or maybe before we actually get our Kubernetes guide and Nick already has a guide that he has written and it's in the STH publishing queue. So depending on what happens, it may go before or after this video. But either way, we will update the link in the description with that as well as it goes live. So if you want to get a cluster of these relatively inexpensive nodes and start doing modern application development in Kubernetes, you can totally go do that. And it's a fairly low cost and low power. In this video, we're going to do something that's a little different. And we're going to talk about upgrading. Now, normally we just go buy these units secondhand. I think we paid about $330 for this machine. And I want to show you one of the ways that you can actually fairly inexpensively upgrade these systems into something that is potentially more useful. So it's a little different. We really haven't done that yet in these videos. So that's going to be something that's a little bit new for this one. But first, let's go look at the hardware in this thing and start getting acclimated to the system and show you what's in it. Looking at the front of the system, we see what I think is a great layout. And it's frankly, a lot better than a lot of the other solutions that are in the market. We get two USB 3 type A ports, and we also get a type C port. That may not seem like a big deal, but it's pretty common. And we've seen a lot of units that only have, say, two USB type A ports in the front. And this actually adds the extra type C port. Now, having that type C port is actually really cool because there are a lot of devices that simply use USB type C these days. And so if you want to go add something like a network adapter, or you just want to go connect the phone or something like that, having that USB type C port is super helpful. Plus, who doesn't like the fact that you can go put the USB-C connector in either way. You don't have to orient it right like you do with a type A port. Also on the front of the system, we have two audio jacks for headphones or headsets. So that's on the front of the system as well. On the back of the system, we have two DisplayPort 1.2 ports. There's also an optional slot. And in our particular system, we have a VGA output. This optional port you should look at whenever you go look at these things secondhand. They can be VGA, they can be serial, you can get an HDMI port, a DisplayPort or they can just be blank and have nothing there. There are already USB 3 ports on the back of the system. So we actually get four USB 3 ports and that's great. Now, some competitive systems actually use USB 2 ports and those are just not as fast and they're just not what you want these days. You want at least USB 3 because you want at least that five gigabit per second port speed. The other big port that you're gonna see on the back of the system is that we have a one gigabit ethernet port. This is an Intel i219LM port, which is the integrated NIC solution for this platform. Something else that we want to mention real quick is that this system actually has this little nub, which is the Wi-Fi antenna nub. And so when you stack these HP systems, one of the nice features and one that I really like is the fact that as you stack them up, you don't have a antenna that's roaming around on the outside that could potentially get snapped between two different nodes. It's actually just a really clean solution. Some people will like more standard connectors because that allows them to put larger antennas on the back of them. But actually, this is kind of a nice solution if you don't need that. Opening the system is super easy. There's one screw, it gets retained in the chassis so you don't lose it. And it's a thumb screw, so it's super easy to open. And then you just pop off the top and you're inside. Hey, before we get too far in this video, just want to note real quick, you might really like my awesome red ST sweatshirt. And if you want one yourself, you can actually go to the STH merch shop on Teespring that you can find linked in the description. There we have a bunch of cool merch. And so if you want to support STH and this project Tiny Mini Micro, that's a great way to go do it. Now back to the system. Inside the system, we have a very standard layout for HP. On the top, we have a processor as well as our RAM. 
As we mentioned, we have the Core i5-8500T, six core, six thread processor in here. This is an eighth generation part, and it has a lot of the modern features that we really like. Now, underneath the fan, you actually have the DDR4 SODIMs, and you can actually see that here. In our system, we got a 16 gig DDR4 SODIM, and so upgrading to 32 gigs was super easy. You just have to add another 16 gig DIMM, and you're at 32 gigs, which is a great fit for the system. We also tried two 32 gig DIMMs, and they managed to work for us, and so that was pretty awesome as well. Still, with the six core processor, I think 64 gigs of memory is probably a little bit overkill, but if you did get a higher end system, maybe that's something you want to look at. Below the CPU and memory, we have all the rest of the expansion really that we care about in the system. And the big first one there that you see is that we have a bracket for a two and a half inch hard drive or a two and a half inch SATA SSD. Since we got this unit secondhand, what we didn't get was the mounting screws to be able to put those into this tray solution. It's something that we actually don't really like. I mean, some of the other solutions like Dell, by the time we got to this generation, they were already putting some of the toolless drive options into their systems, and they were doing that well before the system came out. And so it kind of feels like this is a little bit of an older solution from HP. If you do get a system that doesn't have a two and a half inch drive, you're probably not gonna have the pegs to be able to go upgrade these things. The other side to it is that if you are just using an SSD, you can basically throw Velcro and just throw it in here and it's not gonna be a problem. So that's just something to keep in mind. HP also uses this nice little ribbon power and data cable. And by doing that, they don't have the hard, big, hard connector that Dell uses in some of their systems and we've seen some other systems. But it also means that as you move, remove this hard drive cage, you may pull that out and you may have to remember to put it back in. We're not gonna say that we've done that a couple of times at this point, but you should definitely check this because, well, it is something that can happen. Underneath that hard drive tray, what you're gonna see is a pretty interesting layout. Now we have our normal one NVMe SSD SSD that we have in there is an M2 SSD. And in this particular unit, we have a Toshiba, which is now Kyokushia NVMe SSD. It's a DRAMless SSD. So it's not something that we tell you to go put in, but at least it works and it's there. And the other feature that's really standard on these platforms is that you're going to see a M2 Wi-Fi card. And this is 802.11ac. One of the other nice things that we've seen in some of these HP units that have that nub for the Wi-Fi antenna on the back is that they come pre-wired for Wi-Fi, even if they don't have the card. Now, it's not always going to be the case. I don't, or at least I don't know that it's always going to be the case, but in our experience in the units that we've purchased, if they don't have Wi-Fi, they tend to have antennas. So these are actually one of the easier systems to go and upgrade if it didn't come with Wi-Fi out of the box. Something that's a little bit different in the system is that you're going to see a second M.2 slot. What's interesting about this M.2 slot is that the hard drive cage that we have actually interferes with the M.2 slot. So if you do want to put a drive there, for example, that tray or the two and a half inch hard drive tray will actually interfere with it. Now, of course, you could just use the cable and then use a two and a half inch drive and not put in the tray and then you're going to be fine. And we've definitely done that in other systems. A good example of that is the HP Elite Desk 800 G4 Mini that we already did a tiny mini micro piece on. This is a absolutely great feature because you can actually put more drives into this system than you can some of the other systems on the market. Now as a little bonus on the hardware side, what I wanna show you is that there's this little tiny VGA connector and it's a little PCB that actually has the VGA connector that goes to the optional slot on the back. And in this little bit of B-roll, hopefully we're gonna see this get replaced. Sometimes if you buy these optional units directly from HP, they're super expensive, but we actually managed to get two of these for I think only like $10 each or something. So for us, that's a great upgrade. Now, if that was a $100 upgrade, it probably wouldn't be worth it. And we would just look for one that has the feature that we want. But if you do go browse around eBay, you can sometimes find good deals on these secondhand. It's also nice to know that there is an upgrade path. So if you did need a, another display port or you need an HDMI port or something like that, there is a upgrade path to be able to do that and have three displays on something like this. So let's talk about performance real quick. First off, the Intel Core i5-8500T is actually a fairly good processor. We really like it because this is the generation that Intel moved that kind of Core i5 SKU from four cores up to six cores and six threads, which is just a 50% higher core count. We also get higher clock speeds, which makes this a really nice system. If you compare it to something like the Core i5-6500T from two generations prior, you're gonna see a huge performance delta. And one of the big reasons for that is just the fact that AMD has come into the market with Ryzen. And while this is still an Intel system, Intel is competitively responding to the AMD threat by increasing core counts. And that's why we get a better system. There is one item that we want to note on this system that I think is important. Now, first off, when we looked at the HP documentation, it says that we could potentially have vPro enabled on our system. After all, it's using a Q-series chipset, so it seems like it could happen. We also have the Core i5-8500T, which supports vPro itself. But when we went in to go configure vPro, we, we couldn't find the feature. And something that was interesting on this particular unit is that when we looked at the 
Intel Core i5 8th generation sticker, it didn't say vPro. And so something we tell people is to always look at that sticker because often if the sticker doesn't say vPro, it doesn't have the feature. And if it does have vPro, then it usually does have the feature. OEMs get some marketing dollars, I think, from Intel, and that's why we get that vPro sticker or we don't get that vPro sticker. And so it's just something to keep in mind that that sticker is actually a pretty good indicator out of the 20 something units that we've purchased. In terms of power consumption, we're seeing something that's pretty similar to a lot of the other systems that we've seen. This particular unit uses somewhere around 12 to 14 watts at idle. And then when we get up into kind of a more loaded mode, you can actually get these systems to start making some noise, but you get power consumption in the over 50 watt, somewhere between 50 and 55 watt range. These systems are not made to be number crunchers. I mean, the performance is actually pretty good, but they're realistically made to sit idle at some point. So if you want to go do like a heavy number crunching exercise and you just want a fast CPU for that, this is not the system to get. This is kind of more of the system that if you're going to use it as a workstation, it probably works great. Also, if you're going to use it as a just encoding server, we're just going to encode things every once in a while. I think that works pretty well. I think another good use case for it is running a lot of VMs and containers and stuff like that that aren't necessarily using a ton of CPU but are using memory, that's another really good use case for this. And a good example of that would be like if you're running a Ubiquiti Unify controller and you just need that controller to be online to go manage all of your network gear, then that's something that works really well. It doesn't use a ton of CPU usually and it uses some memory. So it's a great application to go put on a system like this. As part of our Project Tiny Mini Micro series, I always like to have some key lessons learned. Like what do we learn by going out and getting over two dozen of these machines? Because we have to learn something every time we go look at a machine, right? And I think that there are a couple of key takeaways here. The key takeaway is really around vPro. This system did not have vPro printed on that Intel eighth generation core sticker. And because of that, we didn't see vPro apparently in the system when we went to go set it up like we do on other HP systems that have it. VPro is absolutely great as a management tool. You can get in, have remote KVM functionality and stuff like that, but it's also a security risk and it's a feature that some IT organizations just don't want to have in their system. So if they wanted a ProDesk 600 G4 Mini, but they didn't want that feature, maybe that's something that they would just take out. I don't know. And kind of the bonus key takeaway is just the fact that this is the ProDesk 600, which means that it sits between the ProDesk 400, which is really kind of the lower end model, and then the Elite Desk 800, which is kind of the higher end model. When you purchase these systems new, they have different things like different support. They have different configuration options. So this has more configuration options and such than you would have on the ProDesk 400 line, but maybe not as much as you'd have on the Elite Desk line. Overall, I'm really happy with this system. Now, this was not the least expensive Core i5-8500T system that we've purchased. We have purchased ones that are a little bit less expensive, but if you compare it to something like the Dell Optiplex 3050 Micro that we just did, well, you'll see that this is a much better configuration for about the same price, and so it's a really good value. We did get Windows 10 Pro licensed on the system as well with the embedded key, and so this is absolutely great. This would be a hard sell at $400, but if you find a configuration like this in maybe the $300 to $340, $350 range, I think it's actually a great value. Hey, if you made it this far, why don't you click on subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with a new video. We have not just the Project Tiny Mini Micro series, but we also have a whole bunch of other content. So if you want to go check out the SDH main site, we have new content every single day there. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.